next Thursday there's no class, just a break to work on projects. And that would be it for the, um, for the semester. Aside from the, you know, we're going to have project presentation period December 16th, I think was the date. So that's a week from next, so it's two weeks from tomorrow. Um, so that would be it for the rest of the semester. Any questions? You guys have homework due on Friday, right this week? I think you're going to submit the midterm corrections as well. If you guys opted to do that, that would be turned in with the homework. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to say. Uh, I was informed by um, one of our TAs that only like half or two thirds of the people have actually done their project uh, milestone reviews. So that was not op optional. Um, if you're doing the project, you have to do these reviews. It's not hard. So you only have to do, I think, two or three of them. Some papers have no reviews. So that's not, we can't work with that. Um, so do them by tonight at midnight. We said last night was the deadline, but we're just going to extend it one more day. Do them by tonight at midnight. It would take you, you know, half an hour or something. So it's not, it shouldn't be a big problem to do that. Um, so like I said, that maybe we didn't convey that clearly enough. That was not optional. It wasn't like, hey, you can do the reviews if you want to. If you don't feel like it, you don't have to. That's not really the way this is supposed to work. Because if people don't have any reviews on their project milestone, then you know, like I said, we can't really work with that. We're just trying to get, um, trying to use these to create like a basic scoring system for who's going to get to present at the end of the semester. So any questions about that or anything else? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think I will release last year's little test this week. Um, it was 35 questions, true, false, multiple choice. Um, the questions are about the same level as the quiz questions. Um, this year will still be 35 questions, true, false, multiple choice. So the same number, same format, different questions than what I give you. But um, most of the people, so I asked the TAs just to refresh my memory, because a lot of them were in the class last year. They said that most people finished with time to spare. So that's, that's going to be the same case this year, um, I hope. The, uh, I don't think if we keep it to 35 questions, then you know, it, it can't really get any longer than it was last year, because they're just true, false, multiple choice questions. Uh, and you'll have one sheet of, of notes for that if you want as well. Um, if you're going to NIPS, next week, then we're going to arrange an early exam session this week um, for Thursday. So um, I think most of you who are going to not be here next Tuesday have emailed me already. Um, if you haven't heard from me about that, then email me and copy um, Han Zhang, your TA, because he's going to proctor an early exam session on uh, Thursday. OK, any other questions? So now to the fun stuff. Um, of the advanced topics uh, that I had proposed as a possible topics, you guys picked um, this one and non-convex uh, optimization. I have to say that those two are among the ones that are out there, the two I know the least about, to be honest, uh, particularly this one. This is quite recent work. Um, so it was good, because um, it was fun for me as well to put these notes together. But uh, it's. This is very recent um, and very active field. So either I predict that you know, if I gave the same lecture next year, a lot of stuff will change. Or um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm predicting like if I gave the same lecture next year, a lot of stuff's going to change. Because it's a very, very fast moving area. So um, last time, just to remind you, we studied the conditional gradient method, uh, also called the Frank-Wolf method. Um, the idea was if we had a convex constrained minimization problem like this one, um, then instead of doing projected, say, gradient descent, which is maybe like a canonical method we, may use, we might use if f was smooth and we knew how to project onto the set C, we, we could do something else called conditional gradient. Um, it's also known as Frank Wolf. Neither of those names really tell you what it's doing. Projected gradient is very descriptive, right? Conditional gradient is not. Neither is Frank Wolf. But what this is doing is it's making a local linear approximation to f, uh, and then it's, it's iteratively minimizing that local linear approximation over the set c. 
So there's no projection. Um, it's not like we're making a local quadratic approximation like gradient descent does, but we're making a local linear approximation to f, and then we're actually minimizing that over the set C explicitly. Those are the Frank Wolf steps. So this is the, the only part that matters in the local linear approximation to f at the point, say, xk minus 1 is the gradient transpose s. Right? That's the only part that really matters. We minimize that over the set C. Instead of taking that as our update, we just kind of move a little bit towards that discovered point uh, and, and weigh some bit um, towards where we are right now. Okay, so take a convex combination of our point where we are now and the, the best point as given by the linear minimization oracle over the set C. Right, if our function was linear over the set C, that would be the best point S. Um, the reason why we like this method is that because for a lot of set C, this was either simpler or more efficient than projection onto C. It was also simpler or more efficient than the proximal operator corresponding to the norm. If C was a, a, a norm ball, okay, so if C was defined something like this, the set of all points x such that the norm of x is less than or equal to t for some norm, then uh, oftentimes, often Frank Wolf is either simpler or more efficient or both more efficient than both projection onto C and the prox operator of the norm. Okay, and, and the reason that this comparison was relevant is because if I had a, a constraint set like this and I didn't really know a good value for t and I was doing an application in machine learning or statistical learning and I just wanted to try a bunch of values of t, then I could equivalently pose the problem as a penalized problem in the norm. And so in that, in that formulation, I'd be actually doing proximal gradient descent with uh, the norm as the non-smooth part. So you'd have to kind of compare it to both. And oftentimes, Frank Wolf would give us simpler or more efficient updates than we could get from the proximal or projected gradient frameworks. So it was a, it was a very scalable method in terms of its um, iterations. Um, that was the appeal of Frank Wolf. So today, we're going to be talking about um, stochastic gradient descent. Um, we'll also work in a bit later, uh, you know, proximal version of this. And we're, again, thinking about very efficient iterations for large problems. So like Frank Wolf, we would do this if we were faced with a very large problem. Uh, this stochastic framework, in a, in a sense, is more general than, um, than any particular algorithm, because the idea is just to approximate the gradient by something and then apply whatever method you want using that approximation to the gradient. Um, we're going to think about gradient descent for simplicity, but um, we'll see later that proximal gradient descent you can also do with something of this type. And there have been papers on using stochastic methods in conjunction with Frank Wolf as well. Okay, so the main idea is really how to approximate the gradient. It's not the particular um, algorithm that we choose to use with, with that estimate of the gradient. So let's think about stochastic gradient descent just to be concrete. We saw this. Um, Early on in the course, I think like right around the time that we learned the gradient descent or subgradient method, we talked about the basics of stochastic gradient descent. And uh, let's just revisit that as motivation for today's, um, today's lecture. So let's suppose we have a, a sum of functions we're trying to minimize. Okay, so our criterion looks like this. Um, the sum of fi of x uh, for i going from 1 through n, and then we're going to multiply by 1 over n. This 1 over n is not important, obviously. If I want to minimize the average of functions or the sum of functions, I get the same solution. But it's just going to make a lot of our notation easier. So I'm going to include that 1 over n. And uh, this is a problem form that we'd encounter quite often uh, if we're doing solving machine learning or, or statistics problems. Because typically, we can think about this as minimizing uh, an average of a loss function over data points. So this i would index a, a data point. And these x, this x would be a parameter that we're trying to solve for. Okay, so like linear regression or logistic regression both fit into this framework. Um, you know, you'll see an example of that just in a second. But think about fi being like the loss evaluated at the ith data point. So, or you can think about it just in generality if you prefer to think about it from kind of this more abstract optimization perspective. This is our criterion. 
And let's suppose we're trying to run gradient descent on this problem. So gradient descent would simply repeat the following steps. Right? Pick some point to start off and then repeat the following steps. Just move in the direction of the negative gradient repeatedly by some amount dictated by the step size tk. What is the, what is the gradient of this loss function? It's simply this, the average of gradients of fi. Okay, it's just because um, obviously the gradient operator is linear. Um, so this would be full gradient descent applied to this problem. Now, the problem with this approach is that when n is very large, it's very expensive to compute this gradient. Right, if n was in the 10,000s or 100,000s or millions, then gradient descent is supposed to be cheap. It's supposed to be a cheap, um, have cheap iteration complexity. That's why we like it. But if n is large, then that's no longer the case. Even though this is linear in n, if n was very large, that might not be desirable. Okay, so in comparison to gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, also called incremental gradient descent, repeats the following steps. I just choose some random index at iteration k, at every iteration, so ik. Okay, pick some index at uniformly at random. And evaluate the gradient of just function fik, so just one of those functions, and move in the direction of its negative gradient. Okay, so don't take an average. Just take a single function, take its gradient, move in, and move in the opposite direction of that. Okay, we learned that you could also choose ik in cyclic order. When we talked about um, stochastic gradient descent earlier on the class, we're going to stick with randomized choices today. Okay, so we're going to draw ik uniformly at random from 1 through n. So across iterations, we could be picking the same point over and over again, too. That's perfectly fine. Just every time we want to take an iteration, a uniformly um, distributed index across this set, 1 through n. OK, so what are some notes um, about stochastic gradient descent. So the first is that, um, well, I already mentioned this. So you, usually we, we take a uniformly random choice of index. The second is that um, a very common thing to do in practice is just to use something called mini-batch stochastic gradient descent. So instead of choosing a single point, we choose actually little b points. Okay, so we choose what's called a mini-batch of points. Um, so take a random subset of the points 1 through n. And then we're going to update according to the average gradient over those uh, functions fi for whose i's were in that, that mini-batch. Okay, so in other words, st start thinking about this statistically. This is an empirical average of n gradients. This is approximating that average with just 1. This is approximating that average with b. Okay, and each time we're choosing the set that we're going to use to estimate the the full average in a random fashion. Okay, so that's the idea behind stochastic gradient descent. Um, and in mini batch stochastic gradient descent, again, we just choose at every iteration a random subset of size b, where b we think of as being much smaller than n. So why would we ever use a mini batch over stochastic gradient descent? It's because um, it reduces the variance of our gradient estimates um, compared to just choosing one single point. So let's first mar remark that um, this is actually OK. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this statement, although I don't know how the expectations on this side. So let's think about f as, um, just think about f of x. That's my full criterion function. OK. Um, and what I'm trying to say here, th these expectations are not actually needed, um, is that if we take usual stochastic gradient descent or, or mini-batch stochastic gradient descent, in either case, the expected value of our gradient estimate is going to be equal to the full gradient. Okay, this expectation here has taken over random choices of indices. That's why this expectation does, is not needed. Right? This, this f of x is a constant with respect to that um, notion of randomness. So the expected value of the gradient of f i k at x is just equal to f of x. And the same is true as if I chose a random subset of size b. Does it require those i by k to be the same? No. Doesn't require that. So think about why this is true. And you'll see it doesn't require that. 
let's think about this first statement. So this is expectation over random choices of indices. Sorry, my handwriting is so sloppy. I don't know why, what's happening today. Um, let's think about this case. So IK is chosen uniformly at random across the set 1 through K. So it has probability 1 over N of being 1, being 2, being 3, being 4, etc. So this is just a discrete random variable, N possible outcomes. And its expectation is literally just this. Because probability 1 over N of being each of these guys. Or the, if, I, if I take gradients, it's the same property. I should say gradient. Okay. So nothing to do with these functions being the same. It's also supposed to be gradient. Okay, and the same same argument holds here. So these are unbiased estimates of the gradient. We're forming estimates of the gradient that are stochastic. They're unbiased. But now let's think about what their variance is. It's not hard to see that the variance here is reduced from the variance here by a factor of 1 over b. That's because each of these things are unbiased estimates. We're averaging them, taking b of them and averaging them. So the variance goes down by a factor of 1 over b. It's just the simple fact that the variance of an average of b things is 1 over b times the variance of any one individual thing if they all have the same variance and are independent. Okay, And here they are, because we're just taking independent uh, draws. Um, but okay, so that, that's good, right? Because we want the, our variance, we want our gradient estimate to be as close as possible to the full gradient. But as lower variance, it's better because it's going to be tracking the full gradient more closely. What's what's the downside of many batch stochastic gradient descent? Each iteration is also b times more expensive. Okay, so it's a trade-off. We are we're getting a better gradient estimate, but at the cost of more computation. OK, so let's go through an example. I think the examples are going to help clarify or solidify a lot of these concepts. So here I took a regularized logistic regression problem. I, I performed logistic regression with 10,000 data points and um, 20 features. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example where n is 10,000 and p is 20. And I'm, I'm applying ridge regularization Okay, because I, I wanted to look at a smooth problem for this example. So this is a very common problem that people solve um, for large-scale classification problems. I mean, they may they make kernelize this problem, but this problem form is, is very popular for large-scale classification problems. And stochastic gradient descent is like the de facto standard for fitting logistic regression at large scale. Okay, so it's a very common combination. Um, and with, with this particular regularization as well, with ridge regularization. So let's get this in the stochastic gradient descent framework. I'm going to write this criterion as the average of i functions. Each is a function of the parameters I'm trying to estimate, beta. So beta is my optimization variable. xi are the features. yi are the labels. And each of these functions, fi, I'm just going to pull out um, this component of the loss, the ith component of the loss. And I'm going to also attach to it the regularization term. So if I average this, clearly I get the full criterion. Okay, so that's how I fit it into the stochastic gradient descent framework. Okay. So fi is the piece of the loss associated with the ith data point, the ith pair xi, yi, and um, the regularization term, the L2 squared term. The gradient computation, right, is um, there should be a 1 over n here, 1 over n in front here. Um, this is the gradient, 1 over n times the this is essentially x transpose the residual, but the residual is defined in terms of the labels minus the probabilities. We've seen this a few times for logistic regression. Um, and this is, it's possible to do when n is moderate, but when n is huge, we prefer not to form this enormous sum, right? So if we think about doing a full gradient descent, so I'm calling that batch gradient descent as well, one update costs order n p flops, okay, because I have to um, sum up n things here. And this is a p-dimensional vector. One stochastic update just costs order p-flops, because all I'm going to do is take out one 
one particular instance of this sum. And one mini batch update costs order BP flops, if B is the size of the batch, because I'm going to be taking out a random B from, those, um, from, from N of those terms in the sum. Okay, so here's the comparison in, in, in iteration cost between these, th these three methods. Very, very big difference if N is large. Okay, think of N as being in the say millions or hundreds of millions for an industry, industry scale problem. Uh, P can be quite large too, but this is a very big difference in cost. So here's an example that's, you know, it's not a huge example obviously, but it's not tiny either. I took 10,000 data points and um, 20 features, and I, I tried to have all methods employ an ideal fixed step size. So I, I tuned the fixed step size for each method independently so it had the best performance possible. Okay, just to try to show a flavor of, of how these methods perform if they're tuned properly, um, putting, the, putting aside the issue of step size choice in practice. Um, I allowed these stochastic methods to have fixed step sizes. The theory that we'll review in just a second requires their step sizes to be diminishing in order to have kind of tight results, but diminishing step sizes here gave similar results as what I showed. Okay, so I just kept them to be fixed. So here's a plot of um, the progress in terms of the achieved criterion value across iterations of full gradient descent in black, stochastic in red, and then two mini batch stochastic gradient descents. One uh, with mini batch of size 10, the other of mini batch of size 100. Okay, so this is a pretty typical picture. I say this is probably like the classic picture for stochastic gradient descent. Um, stochastic gradient descent, it kind of bounces around as it gets closer to the optimum. So it doesn't really have a very good convergence to high accuracy, but it does just fine, depending on the criterion, up until some kind of region in which it just kind of bounces around. As you make the mini batch size larger than 1, so as I move from 1 to 10 to 100, the estimates get stabilized. Okay, but they're still going to bounce around. They're just going to bounce around at some lower, um, at some higher degree of accuracy or lower criterion value. And none of them can really compare to full gradient descent, which descends smoothly like all the plots we've seen. Okay? So this is kind of like the classic picture. Um, here's another. Uh, interesting way of looking at it. Now I've reparameterized the x-axis by flop count rather than iteration number because as we said, each iteration here takes on the order of uh, 200,000 flops. Here it's um, 20,000 flops. Here it's 2,000 and there it's just 20. Okay, oh sorry, 20 for the red, 200 for the green, 2,000 for the blue, and 200,000 for the for the, the black, okay, because it's, it's order NP, here it's order 100P, here it's order 10P, and, and for red it's order P. Okay, so they're very different flop counts. So here I've reparameterized according to flops. Now I've put the, the x-axis on a log scale so that we can kind of look at them all. You see some very interesting trend here with stochastic gradient descent, and this is going to be explained by the theory that I review in just a few slides. Um, it looks like we're kind of at a wash as we take the batch size larger and larger. In the sense that when all the methods start to get into their convergence regimes, no matter what the batch size is, they kind of trace out a common convergence curve. So um, in other words, where this red curve leaves off, as the green curve starts to get into its convergence phase, it kind of picks up as well from that same spot. So if we were to run Stochastic gradient descent for something like a thousand flops, we'd be making as much progress per flop as we would be if we ran mini batch of size 10. Okay, and the same is true as I look at the trade off between mini batches of size 10 and 100. Once they start ending their convergence regimes, it's really like you don't gain that much by taking mini batches. Now, you do gain early on, right? So early on with um, a mini batch of size 100, I'm not doing nearly as well as I am with a mini batch of size 10. So maybe actually, you know, if I, if I only look at the algorithms early on in their iterations, there's a difference in the mini batches. But as I look at them, they start to converge. There's not a huge difference. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to close this. It's quite loud. Say it again. <laughs> 
right? Um, so people don't typically use backtracking for stochastic gradient descent. It's usually diminishing step sizes or fixed step sizes. So diminishing ones will help, but you're, you're not guaranteed to have a descent method anyways. So the stochastic nature of the problem makes it so that you're only ever evaluating noisy gradients, and the criterion is defined in terms of the full sum of functions, so you're not guaranteed to descend on it. Yeah? Is there, has there been any analysis on increasing batch sizes as iterations move on? Or it seems like a reasonable thing to do to get warm starts for, for Yeah, there's been some work on that. Um, so I don't have a reference in the slides, but I can, if you remind me after class, I can maybe um, try to find a reference for you. There's been some work on that. Most of the work in stochastic gradient descent uh, is divided among people who, who employ stochastic methods in practice and people who study stochastic methods in theory. And that's actually quite a big division compared to the other things we've learned because, like I said, in industry, stochastic gradient descent is like the standard. And so it's extremely, uh, it's like the, you know, one of the main tools they, they use. In terms of the optimization community, it doesn't have the same kind of central role. It's maybe not quite as hotly pursued. Um, but recently, there's been kind of a revival of interest, which is what we're going to get to in this lecture. All right, so the uh, message here is that you know, it may seem that as we increase the batch size, OK, it is true that the gradient estimates get less variable. That's good. But our iterations get more expensive in terms of flops. That's bad. But overall, it's like we're not really gaining that much as we enter the convergence phase. OK, so making the batch sizes bigger, we kind of trace out a common convergence curve. Um, last picture, and now for this last picture, it's important to look back at the criterion. Um, is this a strongly convex criterion? Nod your head if you think it is. Everyone should be nodding their head. So look at that, that L2 squared term at the end. That's always going to make it strongly convex, right? There's no question about whatever happens in the first part. The L2 squared term is always going to make it strongly convex, provided lambda is positive. OK, right? Because I'm adding a strongly convex term to another function. It's strongly convex, in fact, with parameter lambda. So if I have a decent amount of regularization, it's even, the, even the strong convexity constant is nice and big. OK, so what do we know about gradient descent under strong convexity? We know that it's going to have linear convergence. Right? It's going to converge quite well, uh, provided that the condition number is, is decent. But again, here, th if I just look at this term, it's strongly convex. Um, and it's, this is perfectly well conditioned. So gradient descent should be doing quite well here. In fact, we can see that's the case. So let's now zoom over to this plot to motivate our discussion on convergence rates. Here I've actually changed the uh, y-axis to uh, fk minus f star and put it on a log scale. And what do we see? Gradient descent has a perfect linear dis, uh, you know, straight line down. So it, it's linear on a log scale, which means that it achieves uh, a rate of convergence that's like um, you know, some rho to the power of k or rho is less than 1. Okay, So that's the convergence rate for gradient descent in this regime. It's what we call linear. Look at the uh, behavior of, stoch of mini batch stochastic gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent when we look at convergence to high accuracy, it's nowhere close to linear. Okay, even though the function that we're trying to minimize is strongly convex, we're getting nowhere close to the rate rho to the power of k, um, we're for some rho less than 1. Even though it may look like here right, we're doing pretty well, if we look at, if when we look at the, the difference in criterion between uh, what's achieved by stochastic gradient descent or many batch stochastic gradient descent and f star on a log scale, we can see we're very far from converging to high accuracy. Okay, so that's that is true in theory as well, um, and this is just a reminder of some of the results we covered for gradient descent. We covered this result for stochastic gradient descent, and this is a result for mini batch. So all these I have references for. Uh, well, this one we proved in class. These two you can find uh, proofs of these in the, in the references at the end of the slides. So let's just recall some basics of convergence analysis. If f was convex and had a Lipschitz gradient, OK, so um, full gradient descent, which I'm going to call fg, full gradient, it satisfies the following, right? Suboptimality after k steps is on the order of 1 over k. That was our vanilla convergence rate. What about stochastic gradient descent? Um, we learned that under diminishing step sizes, if f is convex plus a few other conditions, and for example, that condition could include 
that every fi is also has a Lipschitz gradient. That would be sufficient. We get a convergence rate that's actually on the order of 1 over the square root of k. Okay, so it's, it's, it's worse. The expected progress after k steps is in the order of 1 over the square root of k. Okay, so we don't even match the vanilla rate of gradient descent when we have Lipschitz gradients. Um, and what about mini-batch stochastic gradient descent? Well, again, if we use diminishing step sizes, like if I took my step sizes to be like 0.1 divided by k, say, uh, and if I had the same conditions, like for example, if, if every one of those functions fi had a Lipschitz gradient, um, then I would get the following. The expected suboptimality after k iterations is on the order of 1 over the square root of b times k, where b is the batch size, plus 1 over k. So why do I have these two terms here, first of all? Right? You, you might think this term is always going to be bigger, so I, I should just keep this, and this doesn't matter. But this is just telling us that as we make the batch size bigger and bigger, we can't get faster than 1 over k. If we make the batch size arbitrarily large, like all the way up to n, for example, we're just going to get back the rate of gradient descent, because we're doing full gradient. Okay, so this, this is just here to remind us that as b gets large, this is just not going to get faster and faster. We can only get all the way up to 1 over k. Think about b being small, like b being much smaller than n on the order of a constant. Then this is the rate. It's just 1 over the square root of b times k. And now we can see actually why uh, the, you know, why mini-batch stochastic gradient descent and stochastic gradient kind of are going to perform similarly. Let's just look at these two. So stochastic gradient, um, this is per iteration, or after k iterations, we get on the order of 1 over the square root of k. If I do mini-batch stochastic gradient descent, I have after k iterations on the order of 1 over the square root of b times k. So here I'm thinking of b is small. Okay, that's why I'm, I'm just considering this term. But each iteration of of the mini-batch stochastic gradient descent method is b times more expensive. Right? Each iteration of mini-batch stochastic gradient um, is right, b times more expensive. So what should I do if I really want to compare these two properly? I should probably compare, for example, Right, I could either compare b steps or b times k steps of stochastic gradient with k steps of mini batch stochastic gradient, or I could say the other way around. So I want to compare k stochastic gradient iterations with, let's say, k over b mini batch iterations, right, to, to put the, the flop count on. Um, the same order. And when I do that, I get this is just order 1 over the square root of b times k over b, which is just equal to order 1 over the square root of k. OK, so in terms of their progress per flop, they're going to have the same, the same rate, which is what we saw in the picture when b is small. OK, so hopefully that calculation made sense to you. That's just convincing you that we don't really gain much per flop by taking the batch size larger. OK, um, so that was to explain conversions in the regime where these functions were uh, uh, differentiable and had a Lipschitz gradient. This regime was actually a bit different because now we had strongly convex functions. And what this told us was that in this regime, it looks like gradient descent is converging at the rate rho to the k for some rho less than 1. But these guys are not. They're very far from that. And that's the strongly convex regime. So let's talk about that 
uh, the, the rates for that regime now. Um, we also saw, and I, don't, I can't remember if we proved this in class or on the homework, but um, this, the proof for this is about as difficult as it was for gradient descent. We also saw that when f is, uh, sorry, the proof of this is about as hard as the one that we, we did do for sure, which is Lipschitz gradients. Um, when f is strongly convex, we get this linear rate of convergence. So the suboptimality after k steps is on the order of rho to the k, where rho depends on the condition number of the Hessian of our function. So why I'm emphasizing that these proofs are simple, um, it's because we're going to see results later that are extremely hard to prove, but that look kind of on par with these results. So we proved these results in the previous Lipschitz gradient result in class. This one we could have proved in class. Um, we're going to see results in a few slides later in the lecture that are just ridiculously hard to prove, but that don't maybe transparently look that much more complicated. So uh, it's, it's very subtle how you analyze these kind of things. OK, so what we didn't cover in class, but I'm telling you now, so this, this, is, this part is new, is that if f is strongly convex, then stochastic gradient descent does not give us this linear rate of convergence. It only gives us this rate 1 over k. So stochastic gradient descent under strong convexity is about as good as full gradient descent under a much weaker condition, which is just Lipschitz gradients. OK, so it's worse in both regimes. When gradient descent gets a 1 over k rate, stochastic gradient gets 1 over the square root of k. When gradient descent gets a rho to the k rate, stochastic gradient descent gives a 1 over k rate. Okay? Now, again, per iteration, it's much, much cheaper. So it's not really fair to compare these things. But at least in terms of its um, conversions for counting iterations, it's not achieving anywhere close to the same speed as gradient descent. Okay, so this was known for a very long time. Stochastic optimization is a very old field. Um, Nemrovsky and others have had uh, a bunch of papers that established lower bounds for stochastic optimization. For, so for a lot of time, people thought that um, this was inevitable because the lower bounds actually matched these. So there's lower bounds that say that if you're minimizing uh, an expectation and all you, have, all you get is, is access to an unbiased estimate of that um, expectation at every step, then the best you can do under strong convexity is 1 over k. The best you can do under Lipschitz gradients is 1 of the square root of k. And that's what we're getting with stochastic gradient descent. So people kind of for a while thought, well, that's, that's it, right? That tells the complete story. Um, recently, there's been some very interesting work that recognized that the fact that all of these lower bounds, these classical lower bounds, they assume that the function we're trying to minimize is, uh, so here I've been as an integral. I said expectation. It's really can, the same concept. It's just some arbitrary expectation, right? So I'm here at my criterion function is this integral of some other function, f of x, which is a function of two variables, x and I always forget what that is, psi, psi, uh, with respect to psi. And we get, we get unbiased estimates of this at every step. But here we actually have a, a special case of this that's much more tractable, potentially. We have a finite sum. Okay, So we actually are not minimizing some arbitrary expectation. It's a finite sum. So uh, as far as these lower bounds go, they could be loose as they apply to finite sums. And we almost never in practice minimize a function that looks like this. We almost always in practice minimize you know, some empirical average. So that's the motivation for all of this fast stochastic work. Can we do better for finite sums? So here's the outline for the rest of the day. Um, I'm going to talk about something called stochastic average gradient, or SAG. Then I'm going to talk about something else called SAGA. I don't know if it stands for anything. Um, and then there's many, many others. So I'll just kind of hint at the other, the other work. So let's talk about stochastic average gradient. Um, this was a paper by Mark Schmidt and some of his co-authors in 2013. I think it was at NIPS. And it was a real breakthrough in stochastic optimization. Um, the idea is actually not super complicated. Um, it's just going to take, I think it takes a few passes at describing the algorithm until you, you get it and it clicks and you go, ah, OK, it makes sense. So um, let's, let's take those few passes and then we'll take a break. Um, so here's the idea. For every function in our finite sum fi, we're going to maintain an estimate of its gradient, gi. Okay? And so we're going to keep a table that maintains estimates of the gradients of all of our functions. And we're going to initialize 
our algorithm at some point x naught, and we're going to initialize um, I meant to write this, gi, so for sag, we initialize, obviously as I've written it doesn't make sense, we're going to initialize our gradients just to be the gradient of our function at the initial point. This is, this is our initial estimate of the gradient of each of our functions. In fact, it's, it's not an estimate, this is the gradient. We're going to start it off there. You could also start off and I'll mention this later, at 0. That's fine. It's fine as well. OK, so this is a much cheaper place to start than here. OK, so here's what we're going to do in words. Um, we're going to be always updating according to the average of these GIs. Because each GI is an estimate of the gradient of FI. If we average them, we get an estimate for the gradient of our function. So at every step, we're just going to be averaging the GIs moving in the, in the negative direction of its average as a surrogate for the gradient of the full function. But before we do that, we're going to actually pick a random function. We're going to replace gi with a more recent estimate of its gradient. And then we're going to take that new average over and over again. So that's what, what it is in words. Here's what it is in symbols. We're going to pick some random function, some, some random ik. We're going to update gik to be the gradient of our function at our current point, xk minus 1. So that's what gik is. And then I'm going to leave all of the other estimates of the gradients unchanged. So for every other function, I'm just going to carry forward my most recent estimate of its gradient. Okay. So just, just only one uh, index, only one gradient is changing as I go from iterations k minus 1 to k. But then I just take their average and I, and I move in that direction as an estimate for the gradient. OK, so let, let me just leave that up for a second so you guys can stare at it. Okay, any questions about SAG? So let's go through a, a, through a few notes, and then we'll take a break. The key, the high level key to this idea, stochastic average gradient, you, can not t you know where the name comes from, we're averaging stochastic gradients, right? Is that every function in our uh, collection is communicating some information about the gradient at every step. Okay, it's not just one function, it's not just b functions, where b is a mini, ba uh, mini batch size, it's every function is communicating some information about the gradient at every step. Um, this is happening because we're actually averaging over uh, all GIs, i going from 1 through n. Now, only one GI is being changed from iteration k minus 1 to k, but uh, we have estimates of the gradient for all of their functions. Now, these estimates of the gradient, they may have been updated several iterations back, so there may be actually estimates for the function's gradient at points that are no longer close to xk, and that's something we have to kind of mitigate. Um, when we, when we take the step size, and also that's make, that makes the proof kind of quite complicated. Yeah? Is that generally applicable so that I can do that with some like proximal gradient then just with a differentiable part of the function? Currently? Good question. Um, for SAG, it's unknown. For SAGA, yes. So we'll, we'll cover SAGA just after this. OK, so every function fi is communicating some estimate of the gradient at every step, not just one, not just b. And this basic idea can be traced back to something called incremental aggregated gradient descent. So this was an older idea from uh, Blatt and Alfred Hero and uh, this other author that was not randomized. Okay, but this, the SAG is kind of like this um, nice combination of this idea with actually a randomized scheme. Um, and what you can see is the estimates are no longer unbiased. Okay, that should be apparent from from just this formula. So if I take uh, the expectation of gik, then it, its expectation is really going to be the gradient of f at point, the point xk minus 1. So that's unbiased. right? I really want to be moving here grad f evaluated at xk minus 1. So gik is unbiased. But all of these don't have the right expectation. 
they're either haven't been touched since iteration 0, in which case their estimates are the gradient at x0 right here, or they were updated several iterations ago, in which case their estimates are the gradient elsewhere. So, so n minus 1 of the terms here have the wrong mean. Okay, so we are not, we're not, we're not unbiased estimates anymore. But what do we gain? We gain uh, a big reduction variance, right? Because we're averaging n things rather than just b things or just taking one thing. Okay, so um, they're not unbiased, so they're biased, but they have a much smaller variance. Um, a very important point, and this is part of the reason why SAG is, um, I think, in a, a very kind of important idea, SAG and SAGA, is that uh, it's actually really quite efficient if, if you're a bit clever about how you store these gradients. And there are many implementation details I'm going to skip. The SAG paper is quite long. Um, take a look at the journal version, not the conference version. It's quite long. It's like 50 pages or something like that, and lots of information about implementation tips. Here is one basic implementation tip that shows you that actually SAG is quite efficient. It's the same cost as just stochastic gradient descent. There's no difference. Um, you might think that, like I said, forming this average could be expensive, because look, this is an average of n things, right? But not if you do it properly. So the way that we write that is as follows. So because um, only one of the GIs has changed from iteration k to k plus 1, this thing here is indeed the average of the GIs at iteration k. right? Because what I do is I take the average of the things at k minus 1. I get rid of the old value for, for that particular index uh, I'm sorry, that should say I, I k. So this is g i k k minus g i k k minus 1 plus the sum of g i k minus 1. So this thing here, this is indeed equal to the sum of uh, g i k. Right? This is just because only one of them has changed from iteration k minus 1 to k, and that's this one. So here I canceled out the old value at function i k, and I put in the new value, and that's the new sum. So in other words, this is the old sum, this part here. And this is the new sum. So if I'm clever about just keeping track of sums, then I just take the old sum, I make an order one update to the old sum, and I store it as part of the new sum. So this, is, this entire computation is actually just order one. It's the same cost as, as a stochastic gradient update. I'm not doing any averaging or any summing as part of this iteration. I'm just storing the sums. Or here I say storing the averages. So I take the, uh, suppose I have a gradient table. Every you know, column in the table is, is one of these GIs. And instead of actually forming an, uh, an average at each step, I just keep track of the table average. And so to update the table average from old to new, I just perform this very cheap update. So we need to store all the GIs. Yes, you need to store all the GIs. So you need to, that's really, uh, so OK, that could be expensive. It could not be expensive. It's going to be about as expensive as storing the data in most cases. Um, and remember, stochastic gradient descent also needs access to the data. So you have to pull out a random index at each step, read that data point into memory, perform the, the gradient evaluation. So you're doing a similar thing here. I'm pulling, out, um, I'm pulling out a data point. I'm also pulling out one of these GIs from my gradient table to form this update. Now, for some problems, um, you can get away with storing much less than gradients, and that's what is the details are given in this SAG paper, but we're just not going to cover that stuff. Yeah? Did you make your running average some sort of weighted average that values the pressure and higher? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, roughly speaking, that's what SAGA does. But um, it's kind of an extreme version of that. It replaces very high weight on recent gradients. So a good question. Other questions? OK, let's pause, and then I will come back and talk about uh, some theory for SAG and SAGA as well.